Uh, I'm Jane Harmon, President and CEO of the Wilson Center Recovering Politician. Uh, it is not a 12-step program. Let's ignore this one. Uh, but on behalf of my co-host, Dr. Sorry. Jim McGann, who's director of the University of Pennsylvania Think Tanks and Civil so Societies Program, that does not fit on a credit card, and Atlantic Council President and CEO Fred Kemp, uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Wilson Center. This is a very, very, very popular event. We have representatives here from more than 25 of the top U.S. think tanks, and many, many more are watching online from all over the world. Today's discussion could not be more timely. How can think tanks navigate in an era of political and digital disruption? Or as Jim McGahn calls it, the new guerrilla war of ideas. We have a superlative panel, um, many of whom I've worked with for years, uh, to address this question. But let me share a few brief thoughts. One, the glut of information makes it extremely difficult to sort facts, evidence, and credible research from alternative facts and fake news. A recent Gallup Knight uh, Foundation survey on trust, media, and democracy shows that nearly three in five Americans uh, believe it is now harder to be well-informed and to determine what is accurate. We've learned, and I'm sure this will be discussed, that a country like Russia can take advantage of fractures in our society through technology and social media with the aim of sowing confusion and mistrust. And something, frankly, that I worry about, just hear me, poor despondent grandma that I am, is whether, over time, information will become so <coughs> corrupted that we won't be able to rely on it at all. <coughs> Surely Walter Cronkite's assertion on the nightly news decades ago that that's the way it is now seems like a total anachronism or an echo from some other planet. Uh, I'm just back from Davos, some of you were there, where we talked a lot about fractures in our collective ability to address critical challenges. And yesterday, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Kirsten Nielsen, spoke here on the threat picture confronting us. Bipartisan conversations, let alone any conversations in Congress about fractures and global threats, uh, almost never take place. Sadly, Congress, if it ever was, is no longer a learning institution. To fill the gap it, as, as sources of analysis, trustworthy expertise, and civil nonpartisan, nonpartisan public discourse, we need think tanks. More than ever, think tanks and the work we do matter. The information we produce matters. The safe political space we provide matters. And it matters to everyone, left, right, and center. We are also gathering today for the unveiling of the University of Pennsylvania's uh, 2017 Global Go-To Think Tank Index. It's another mouthful, Jim. Uh, thanks to Jim for the enormous work that he and his team put into these ratings, as well as his many global conferences that connect think tanks all over the world. I said at breakfast that the conversation among us and the collaboration among us will be, uh, I think, a secret to our future success. Uh, together, we can do more than we can do separately. And you may not know, by the way, that Jim does all this, I said on a shoestring, he says on a no string, with uh, no full-time staff or dedicated budget. Finally, uh, in case you missed what's happening tonight, today's event coincides with President Trump's second State of the Union message. Did you know that it was Woodrow Wilson who restored the practice discontinued after Thomas Jefferson to deliver a public address on the State of the Union in Congress? So at 5.30 today, the Library of Congress uh, and the Wilson Center have a reception to celebrate this and mark the beginning of the Wilson Center's 50th year. We're proud of our legacy, and we're also proud of the incredible work done by others in this room. Surely Congress and the world needs all of us. With that, let me thank you again for being here, and now over to the one and only Jim McGahn. Just a few uh, brief comments. Uh, this program uh, here in Washington uh, will occur simultaneously with uh, programs in uh, Chicago, uh, in Grand Rapids, 
uh, in Houston, Texas, uh, in San Francisco, all to focus on uh, the uh, why think tanks matter. More importantly, uh, 175 institutions around the world in 100 plus cities uh, have already, because of they're ahead of us in time zones, have launched similar programs. The effort is really to create a global community of think tanks. And while politics and public policy may separate us, there are a whole host of challenges uh, that uh, unite us. And this morning's discussion, um, I am pleased to say uh, that the state of think tanks is excellent in terms of uh, what was reported at the meeting uh, that uh, 35 uh, senior executives, presidents, and vice presidents of think tanks presented that given, unfortunately, uh, the disruptive politics, the dysfunctional politics in terms of our government, it provides an opportunity. Uh, and so while we face many challenges, I think in this digital era and in this disruptive politics, uh, that it's an opportunity for think tanks and the challenge is to see those opportunities, to seize those opportunities, and more importantly, to adapt the institutions because I think these challenges will continue. And my great concern, which I look forward to hearing from the panel, is that we are not innovative enough and not adapting enough to meet these fundamental challenges. The way, as was reflected in terms of David Sanger, other uh, sectors have essentially uh, and are meeting these challenges and are aware of them. I think equally we need to be, and this is the purpose of these and other meetings and the summits, is to help bring the attention to how we might transform uh, our institutions, how we might explore uh, new and uh, more innovative business models to, to meet the very fundamental challenges uh, we face, which are both um, one's threat to our uh, democracy in terms of uh, sophisticated um, efforts to influence elections and institutions, but also in terms of uh, the dysfunctionality in terms of our uh, politics. And it's these institutions in terms of the ideas and helping um, see a way forward toward greater compromise um, and greater so solutions uh, to the many challenges we face, which will be difficult because the choices and options uh, will be uh, much uh, uh, narrower than they have been historically. So once again, thanks to all of you for coming today. Um, and I look forward to uh, this exceptional and very consciously uh, diverse panel in terms of type of institution, politics, uh, approach, uh, to public policy research and analysis. So without further ado, Josh. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Josh Rogan. I'm with the Washington Post. Thank you to Congresswoman Harmon and Fred Kemp for hosting. Thanks, Jim, for preparing uh, the latest iteration of the go-to index uh, in preparing for this event. I talked to many think tank executives who every single one of them said, oh, I don't follow the rankings, followed by a, a pause, and then, do you know what I ranked this year? Yeah. <laughs> so it's clear that uh, your research is having an impact. Uh, you know, this is a special treat for me, um, you know, as a personal anecdote, as a sophomore at GW in 19, I uh, walked yeah. into the Brookings Institution without an appointment into the office of a scholar by the name of E.J. Dion, and I said, I work, I live three blocks away, I work for free, he looked at me and said, there's your desk. And that was my <laughs> very yeah. first internship in Washington. And I, uh, in the ensuing years, I've come to rely on the work that all of you do, as many journalists do. I, I believe there's a deep symbiosis between uh, the research that you provide and the journalism community's ability, ability to distribute it, and uh, often with credit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> you know I, uh, when the Trump administration came into power, uh, actually after the election, you know, there, there was, a, there was a, a panic, let's say, in the think tank community. And also, born out of the election, born out of the primary, many think tanks uh, stood neutral, some didn't, some scholars did, some didn't. Uh, so I decided to collect the conventional wisdom at the time, as is my want, and I wrote a column, and it was called, uh, the de This is the Death of Think Tanks as We Know Them in DC. <laughs> And it was a simply a, a roundup of uh, administra Trump administration, incoming officials, transition officials, 
and people in the art community, this community, who believed that you know perhaps this was a moment where the um, you know the administration and the think tank community might not be able to kiss and make up, where the work might have to find new audiences, uh, where the work might not be incorporated, and the people not, might not be incorporated in the way that we've all become accustomed to. You know, I'm happy to say a year into it, uh, the reports of the death of the think tank community have been largely exaggerated by me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that being the case, I thought this is a perfect opportunity to sort of check into where we are. So without too much uh, ado, what I want to do is I want to uh, ask each of our distinguished panelists who need no introduction uh, to give us two to three minutes of, uh, you know, answer, following up on Jim's question. The state of think tanks is what? And then how your organization uh, is is faring a year into the Trump administration. Then I'll lead a short discussion and then we'll get to your questions as soon as we can. Um, we'll go in alphabetical order. Evo. Thanks, uh, great to be here. Thanks, Josh. Uh, wonderful to be uh, back in Washington and that's where I'm gonna start. Uh, I'm not in Washington, I'm in Chicago. And I think we learned one thing on November 8th, uh, 2016, which is that sometimes what happens in Washington actually isn't very important. Sometimes what's happening outside of Washington drives what may be happening inside Washington. And one of the roles of think tanks is to try to figure out and understand what that is. Uh, it's true for people in Washington to find out what's happening outside of Washington. And it's true for people outside of Washington to understand what's happening in their communities and may have an influence on what's happening in Washington. Uh, what do voters think? Why do they think what they think? Uh, what are the policy concerns that they have? How do they want to communicate that? And how does that uh, get to the policymaker? And how can the policymaker start making sense of that? And one of the roles that uh, a place like the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has is to highlight those kinds of questions. It turned out, nobody really figured it out, at least I didn't, um, that by November 2016, what a lot of the foreign policy community, which is where I come from, took as self-evident actually wasn't self-evident. It wasn't self-evident that free trade is a good thing. It wasn't self-evident that alliances that we have created over the last 60 or 70 years are a good thing. It wasn't even self-evident that democracy is something that we shouldn't only have at home but is a good thing to have abroad. Because the day-to-day -day concerns that people had, whether it was economic or social or uh, what have you, were overpowering in certain communities and certain places uh, these kinds of perspectives. And if we didn't understand that, we were actually not talking. Uh, we were only talking among ourselves uh, and no longer talking to a larger community that, for the health of our democracy, uh, is very much part of what happens here. So part of what we're trying to do is to understand what's happening. We have been polling American opinion on foreign policy since 1974. Uh, we have a very rich database to understand wh what Americans think, how they think uh, about certain foreign policy issues <coughs> um, uh, that we then use to say, why are people thinking what they are thinking? And more importantly, why are politicians and policymakers thinking about what people are thinking? Uh, uh, and how does that translate directly into policy? Those are kinds of big questions. Um, and so one, one reason why think tanks matter is to understand that what's happening not just in our own circle here inside the Beltway, which is an important part of what, what is going on in the world, but there's a world beyond the Beltway, just as in America there's a world beyond the United States that's important uh, for us all to understand. And if think tanks can help be <coughs> conduits uh, of analysis, of understanding, uh, of explanation, uh, as well as of uh, how you, based on that analysis, move forward in, in certain policy realms, they are doing a job uh, that, frankly, in the political world, which used to be the communicator of the views outside uh, of the Beltway into the Beltway, no longer do. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. And uh, as the newbie in the room, I, I want to thank, uh, thank you for uh, convening this group and how important it is. And I think it speaks well to our country when a diversity of think tanks like this can come together and talk about ideas and uh, the 
what that means to our country as they witness this, I think, uh, uh, is a great example of what can be. And I think we in the think tank community can show the political classes how it's done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, Josh, I remember reading your article and <laughs> thinking, what planet is he on? The <laughs> death of, <laughs> I get that a lot. <laughs> the death of think tanks, my goodness. At the Heritage Foundation, we've never been busier. <laughs> Um, first of all, um, many, um, one of the most important jobs I have is differentiating the, uh, the very conservative Heritage Foundation from the Republican Party. We are not the shills or the flax for the party. So what that means by definition is that we are promoting conservative ideas, philosophy, and uh, we have a responsibility to hold this president and this administration accountable uh, just as we would anyone. So uh, we're going to produce data, research, and analysis that everyone can, uh, can, can depend on and use. No, no matter where you are on the political spectrum, I hope that you will um, recognize that the work produced by our scholars are, uh, is work that you can depend on. Um, I would say that uh, for many years, going back as far as 1981, the Heritage Foundation has produced a mandate for leadership. It was first used by President Ronald Reagan, and it was actually the blueprint that he passed out to his cabinet, said, here are some ideas for governing. Um, amidst all the noise that's going on uh, in this town right now, I, I must admit that I was even surprised when we did the analysis to determine with our 2017 mandate for leadership, how this administration was doing. Um, so we have had a profound opportunity as a think tank to influence the policy that's going on uh, in this particular administration, both uh, on the economic side, the foreign policy side, many of the domestic issues. So I think that uh, there is a role for think tanks even today amidst the noise uh, that we are having uh, an incredible uh, opportunity to uh, hold that message up to this administration and to hold them accountable. Um, I would say as we get into a little bit more uh, the topic that we're here to talk about this morning, one of the challenges that we have is operating in this digital environment how do you take a scholarly research paper and do I dare say dumb it down to a Twitter? Uh, <laughs> do I dare say how do you, uh, when, when, when the masses of people in this country are receiving their information uh, through digital platforms um, and you want to be able to bring your ideas uh, to that constituency, the good news, that's a challenge, and we can talk a little bit about how we do that um, and some of the creative and innovative things we're doing uh, a little later. But I would say that there is still an appetite for and still uh, consumers who want the thoughtful papers, who want to know the research and the background. There are those various congressmen and senators who still say, do you have any research that can help me think through this issue. Um, so I think that there is an appetite for both. How do we take our complex public policy issues and make them available in a digital platform, as well as how do we take the uh, research, the analysis, and the data that we produce and help it to inform the public policy debate. So uh, we have our work cut out for us. We have to do both. Excellent. We will get to that in the Q&A. Uh, so <clears throat> I'd start by saying when I was chief of staff of the Pentagon, I always feared Josh because whenever I heard <laughs> him that there was probably something coming down the pike that wasn't always necessarily going to be good. Very important, but not always good. Um, I, I love the Kennedy School. So I'm the co-director of the Belfer Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. I love the Kennedy School. I went to school there before the Obama administration. I was back up there teaching. It's a little bit different than some of the other think tanks. Uh, in that it is a school. And so we have three primary goals. Our first is to do research, and it's the height of academia, and it's Harvard, so that doesn't mean that it's always relevant to the real world, but we try very hard, <laughs> uh, and it's to have impact. The second thing we do is we teach and we train, and we want to educate the next generation of leaders 
uh, to get stuff done, to have good ideas and, and to make it happen. And to me, that's the most rewarding part. I had a class of almost 100 students this year in a cyber operations class that I was teaching. And there's just nothing more fulfill fulfilling from the start of the class when they can't even really understand how the internet works or what TCP IP is to the end of the class when they're in a simulation and they're essentially playing the president or the White House chief of staff or the secretary of defense and they're in the nuance of cyber policy issues, I think it's really important. The third thing we do though is we try to actually do stuff. We run projects where we're trying to make a practical difference. So I'm running a project on defending the digital democracy which is about protecting democratic systems from nation state threats. Uh, Ash Carter, the former Secretary of Defense, I can now officially call him Ash instead of Sir all the time. He's running a project on innovation, technology, and public purpose because he wants the country to get back to a place where technology and innovation mean something better for the country, not just about you know, Silicon Valley maybe doing a little bit better off. Nick Burns is running a great project on the future of diplomacy. Megan O'Sullivan, a real live Republican, which we don't have a lot of up in Cambridge. Um, great project on energy security and the geopolitics of energy. So there's a lot going on. And um, it's not to say, though, that everything is perfect. And so I wanted to reflect a little bit on some of the things where we need to do better. First, it's not diverse, right, either from a gender perspective, a race perspective, and definitely not from a political philosophy perspective. We recognize that, and we need to work on that. Um, also, because it's Cambridge, it can be a little naive, and so we really need to work on making sure that students are trained in a way that they can get stuff done, they don't have an ego, you know, and they go out uh, willing to contribute, not just try to be the next secretary or something. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank you, and I'm, I'm honored to be here, and it's great to be with so many friends and leaders uh, that uh, have been role models. So, uh, I'm Neera Tandon, I'm president of the Center for American Progress, and the Center for American Progress is uh, ideological, but not, uh, but not partisan. And uh, so I'd say in this world, uh, in the world we're in today, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go from my perspective, um, I think it is a unique moment in American history where we have political leaders who are challenging facts. So I will admit to uh, an existential dread after the election when we had a, an entire election process where facts themselves, uh, the press itself, uh, were attacked uh, by the political leadership that we see. But what's been interesting to me is that over the last year, uh, facts really matter. And I'd say for the progressive side, Facts are as important as ever. So what do I mean by that? Uh, in the healthcare debate, we saw conservative efforts to undermine the Congressional Budget Office weeks ahead of its announcement. But yet, those facts were really important to not just the press, but how voters saw the bill. Uh, we see amongst uh, progressives uh, a, a real hunger for facts. So some of the ways that we've innovated in the last year is to turn our attention not just from, not into just Washington and Congress, but to be a resource for grassroots activists and people who are interested in the debate happening. There is a huge demand we see for information people can trust about what's happening. So just analysis we've done on how many people lose health care per state, or what the tax impact is on real people, has had, we've seen huge increase in demand for that information. We've put that out digitally on Twitter and Facebook, and we see people sharing information from a think tank in ways that they haven't ever before. And so I actually think that the assault on facts is making is creating a counter reaction where more and more people are, are looking for institutions they can trust to provide them with a real sense of what's going on and the massive amounts of disruption people are seeing every day, uh, particularly when they wake up and check the news for Twitter. So, uh, so we see this as a real opportunity for us and I would imagine others to to become a, uh, to engage in a conversation much more broadly with the public than we have in the past. Thank you so much, Sarah. 
Thank you. Thanks for hosting us here today. And uh, I'm Sarah Rosa Mortel, president of the Urban Institute, which is a, a organization who uh, has gone beyond the scope of its name in the range of issues that it tackles today. We're, too, about to celebrate a 50th anniversary, but since we're moving next year, we're going to celebrate the launch of our next 50, because we'll <laughs> have new digs, and it'll be a more fun place for a party. Um, but as we think about <laughs> uh, the way in which uh, we play a role uh, in this environment, um, and we are a heavily empirical organization, um, uh, think about three key strategies. The first is partner with tech, and I'll talk a little bit more, and help them learn the world. We need to learn from them, and they need to learn the world uh, of policy and practice. Uh, uh, go local uh, and regional, and that is partly a way to both influence back here, but also to learn and uh, remember that decision makers are not only located in our fair town, uh, but all across the country. And then finally, to think long. So just another word about each of those. Um, much of the grand innovation and change happening in our society uh, that may in the long term produce uh, challenges for us, but also great opportunities. Uh, is coming from sectors that largely see government and its function and policy as largely irrelevant to them. Although recently, as uh, others have noted, there are some folks saying, oh, you know, we got to pay attention to what's happening there because they're paying attention to us. Um, and they're trying to learn and understand our world. We need to learn and understand theirs. Uh, at the last session, Jim pointed out some of the, and others pointed out some of the, uh, I'm sorry, John Hamry pointed out some of the challenges of the civil service in uh, getting the kind of skills in government. And so we, Think Tanks as a Bridge, can help to find and learn from the technology sector possibilities for new ways of doing things that we could completely reinvent. But they need to learn from us too. Because you can lock a bunch of app developers in a room and try to solve a social problem, and if you do it without any reference to 30 years of prior efforts on that problem, you're not going to get as good an answer. But the combination of those together may be able to invent something new we couldn't have imagined before. We need to bridge those very different languages and cultures in order to find those solutions. So uh, partner with tech. Go local. Um, in every city and state and regional go area, uh, group of decision makers, business communities, they're trying to solve all the problems we talk about nationally, employment, education, um, criminal justice, in their communities. And often most of the powerful decision making levers are there. And one of the best ways to get Washington to pay attention to an idea is to see it in practice in places working or not, tested, tried. and so. A lot of what we're trying to do is figure out how it's a lot harder and more complicated and challenging for think tank business models, as we talked about at breakfast. But think about how you bring the insights from your analysis into the, uh, uh, in the hands of decision makers, and then also learn from them and create a, a virtuous feedback loop. That will in turn help us to influence and in time, I hope, uh, uh, improve the quality of discourse here in Washington. Because locally, there's pragmatism across uh, the political spectrum in ways that there isn't always in Washington. And finally, think long. Um, uh, politicians, by definition, have to worry about the next day, the next month, the next year, uh, what they're going to say. Um, but the challenges that we are facing, we're at one of those moments when the ways in which technology is going to change the labor market and what demands of our workforce, the way in which we prepare people uh, for that workforce, uh, the way in which geography determines so much of a person's uh, capacity to get ahead in life, all of that um, are problems that we're going to have to be wrestling with for the next 20 or 30 years. And our capacity to think about how we solve those problems out frees our mind to think beyond some of the tweaks to the existing institutions we have. And then you can come back and think about what's the incremental way to move towards those visions. But those future thinking kind of also gets you a little bit out of the partisan divide. So partner with tech, uh, work local, uh, think long. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Okay, thank you, Josh. I want to thank uh, Jane for hosting us here at the Wilson Center. I want to thank uh, Jim. This is an extraordinary panel, and it, you really, every year when these rankings come out and we have these events, you really force us to do something we don't naturally do, which is to, to sort of pick our heads up above the sort of day to day emails, phone calls, grant requests, and the like to sort of really think about what it is we do. And, Josh, I want to thank you as well for forcing us to do that last year with your article 
on the death of think tanks. I had the same reaction <laughs> that uh, Kay did to that, actually, where I was like, nah, don't quite buy it. But once it started circulating around my board, <laughs> all of a sudden, uh, <laughs> you know, I decided maybe I, I you know, uh, this is sort of a Pepto-Bismol moment, let's say. But in, in the end, I think uh, really last year for us at Hudson was just an absolutely extraordinary year, Every any way you look at it. We had made a major investments the years into this election in hiring up staff and moving into a new facility, in expanding our operations, expanding our government relations uh, team. And uh, <clears throat> your article came out, and a number of similar ideas sort of emerged about uh, think tanks having less of a role, this being sort of more of an instinctive administration. But we actually found it to be quite the opposite. And it turned out to be just an extraordinary year for us on, on the revenue side. Our revenues were up almost 50%. On the, on our endowment way up as well, thanks to significant donations. But more importantly, on the policy side, we found that there was a real need, particularly on the bilateral relations side, to get away from the noise that had developed here in Washington in the press, people saying what President Trump was going to do, how his team was going to act on things. And we found ourselves, and I was away from my, I usually do, I'd speak French, so I do live French language coverage of U.S. elections, uh, not a huge market. Uh, <laughs> was up in New York for the, uh, for the election of uh, President Trump uh, for uh, French TV. Then I came back down. My wife and I went away for our 20th wedding anniversary. And by the time I returned to my office on uh, the 10th, I, there, was a, there, were, there were, must have been 40 voicemails from all sorts of people I hadn't heard, of, heard from in years in the diplomatic circle around the world deputy foreign ministers, vice foreign ministers, deputy national security advisors, ministers from government around, trying to make sense of what Trump was up to. And it was all of a sudden sort of a new thing for us to kind of, our mission is to promote U.S. international leadership in partnership with our allies. It is not often to translate sort of what policy is going to be, but it ended up being very useful because we would hear things from our friends and then pass them along to our friends in the administration. And uh, uh, it, it, it turned out just to, to be very useful in terms of us having a team of major policy experts and being able to put them to work to sort of think through policy solutions. And we've been able to have an impact on the national security strategy, on the debate over missile defense, domestic policy, the debate over uh, regulatory policy, uh, other, other it's, a, it's a long laundry list I won't go through, but it's, uh, and this sort of, this role of bridging from Washington to the rest of the world it's a slightly different role than Evo was talking about bridging Washington to the rest of the country, but it's been it's been very useful, and whether it be in Delhi, Tokyo, Brussels, London, Paris, Taipei, it's a it's a long laundry list. Uh, in terms of challenges, I guess sort of the the big challenge we faced last year internally was sort of this uh, the uh, policy versus politics divide, and sort of when when do you red flag a scholar and you sort of say, hey, don't publish that under the Hudson byline, whether you're for President Trump or against him, that's, that's, that is not a policy research zone. And you can publish it, you can tweet it, you can do what you want on an individual basis, but that is not something you ought to do. And that's something which uh, came to the fore last year as a real challenge. But overall, uh, I think it was an extraordinary year. We were helped by having a number of longtime friends who went into the administration in key positions, whether it be our distinguished fellow, Elaine Chow, whether it be Mike Pence, who is an old friend of the Institute from our days in Indiana. It's a long, long list. And I, what, what amazes me, so this administration, and I think Kay can confirm this, others, they've reached out to us, and uh, they wanted us to backstop them in public opinion. They reached out. They said, look, this is what we're trying to think through. How do you handle this issue? What do you recommend? And I'm, I'm amazed at both the rapid response, uh, the eagerness to uh, be engaged intellectually, and the willingness to put new ideas forward. Excellent, thank you. All right, so we can already see that we have a diverse group of institutions here with different ideologies, different characters, different sizes, different goals, different missions, all facing basically the same big challenges, right? Uh, in a very quick word of defense of my column, uh, <laughs> I'm happy to have been wrong, but you know, what I was expressing there was uh, uh, a sentiment inside the Trump team during the transition, okay? And it's totally correct that they came in very skeptical of it, all of these institutions, and that they've evolved, not everybody, but a lot of them have evolved to realizing the value that these institutions provide and actually depending on them uh, uh, in a way that really I didn't anticipate. Uh, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't read the go-to index yet, I'm about to give away a detail <laughs> here. The number one, well, first of all, the number one overall US worldwide think tank was the Brookings Institution. Uh, the number one most significant impact on public policy 
for 2017 was heritage. Uh, so let me start with Kay. What's the mm -hmm. trick? How do we how do, <laughs> how do we influence the Trump administration? Well, the yep. trick is um, that uh, he tapped into something, something, and I know there are people who are still spending a lot of energy, effort, time, resources trying to figure that out, particularly uh, on the progressive or Democrat side of the aisle. Having said that, um, he knew that he needed to turn to policy professionals to try to figure out how to sort of capture what he was seeing out in middle America and turn that into policy. So when you actually look at the transition, when I first began to realize immediately after, uh, dur during the general election and after the primaries, as the transition team came together, there were those of us who went, wow, he's quite serious about policy. And the Heritage Foundation had a profound influence on that transition team. I mean, I got the call to uh, come in and to work on, uh, at a very high level, some of the issues there. You, there are names that you know and respect uh, who were working in the public, in the uh, national defense area, in the economic area. And so as we began to see during the transition period, these scholars coming in to begin to shape policy, there was a, okay, this could be okay, this, this might be all right. Uh, one thing, by the way, that, that I think is interesting, for the first time in American history, did you know that both transition teams were housed in the same building? Um, and we used to joke about the fact that we were in the Trump team like on seven and eight and the Clinton team were on uh, uh, 11. 11 and what, 12? Just 11. Just 11? <laughs> mm. And there was a blank space in between for all the listening devices from foreign countries. <laughs> um, and uh, as a result of that, you know, I think that um, we saw from the very beginning that there was a seriousness about policy that somehow had not made it over to the political arena. And so as the transition plans were being developed and we heard the rhetoric that was going on during the campaign, already that divide was beginning to happen. And so it did not come as a complete surprise to me that we started seeing great policy uh, you know, come forth at a very, sometimes from a very low level and from the cabinet level, all across government. Um, I think we lost close to 70 employees into the uh, administration, quite a number uh, of thinkers, scholars, practitioners, experienced people that went in. So uh, I think that there's some measure of comfort that all of us can take from that. The other thing that I think the American people would find some comfort in is that there is a spirit, a bipartisan spirit that exists within this town at many levels. Um, and uh, the, the conversations that happen among us, um, uh, the conversations that happen with our colleagues at the Kennedy School. Uh, there is a class of people in Washington who care about good government, who care about great policy, who may disagree uh, about what that policy ought to be, but have profound respect for those individuals who uh, may come from a different perspective. And I think that's something that we in the think tank community uh, can contribute to the public discourse that's going on in our country right now. Thank you. I, I'm guessing Nira wants to give a rebuttal, basically. <laughs> but I, 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 I don't know. But before I say before, before I go to you, I also want to add a question. Yes. To you because I, don't, I, I wasn't I wasn't thinking rebuttals. So okay. <laughs> well, whatever, however you want to phrase it. But I did want to mention that CAP did receive the ranking for number one best use of the internet. In the, in the new go-to index. So I w whatever you want to say about what you just heard, but also I'd like you to sort of talk about how your organization in 2017 has adjusted to the new reality. And perhaps you, you're, you can 
assume that you might not have great access and influence over the Trump White House? And how do you position That's a safe yourself? bet. And so how do you position yourself and how do you maximize your ability to get uh, your get stuff done? Yeah, the- so our I, I, last year was actually, I mean, it's interesting, it's interesting phenomenon because last year was uh, our best year of fundraising in our history. We had our largest growth ever, except for maybe our first and second year. Uh, so uh, I think our focus is definitely on policy impact. Uh, now, from our perspective, we are defending policies uh, that are we see as under assault. So our number one policy objective was to, uh, it last year, was to defeat efforts to uh, destroy the ACA. Uh, our biggest focus was, uh, and CAP is different from other institutions. We have a C3, the think tank itself, and then a C4, uh, which an advocacy arm, which is very much focused on social media communications, online organize, organizing. Um, so I'll, I'll actually just give an example of, of how we worked differently last year in a way that we've never worked before. So. We saw defending the Affordable Care Act as an important policy objective. Our scholars did analysis on impact of uh, taking away the ACA. So some of the data you might have seen um, on pre-existing conditions impact, coverage losses, where things our scholars did. But what we saw in this new world is that you the, there is a widespread uh, interest in taking information and combining it with action. So uh, maybe it's that progressives are a lot of nerds or something, but information that we gave them on the bill and its impact on people spread widely, and then other groups uh, use that to make, to uh, organize political activities. So organize that information to call members of Congress and say how many people are gonna lose coverage in your district. So we saw a a real marriage between grassroots advocacy and impact, Uh, people going to town halls with uh, information about the bill provided by our scholars and asking members of Congress, why were they going to do this particular, why were they voting? So I I think there's a a new opportunity for, for us at least to be, uh, to be a resource, again, not just to influence influencers directly, but what we see is, is that the greatest way in this new world for us to have impact uh, on public policy is direct democracy, is people becoming engaged in the political process, calling their members of Congress, and taking action. And uh, we see a unique role for ourselves in providing that information to activists and and just regular people who are getting engaged in politics for the first time. We see a whole range of people who've never been in politics, who've never done political action of any kind, coming into the political process in response to the Trump administration. And they don't want to just be angry. They want to have facts. We get questions all the time about, what do I say when the member of Congress gives me this answer. What's my follow-up? Which is a kind of extraordinary moment that we're in. Could you talk a little bit about what your organization has done in terms of the internet that seemed to have caught oh, yes. the, so, the attention of the ranker? So uh, we have been focused a long time in exactly what Kay raised, which is how do you take information and boil it down so that uh, to a tweet, <laughs> to uh, to inspire action. So uh, last year we invested a lot in online uh, advocacy and communications. So what does that really mean? We spent a lot of time figuring out how, how you can communicate our research and analytics into video, uh, tweets, social media, interviews, podcasts. Um, and this, you know, there's just a tremendous hunger for people understanding what is happening. And, uh, you know, we're in the top 100 podcasts <laughs> in the country, and we're always trying to experiment with new ways to get information out. So we definitely do the traditional work of think tanks, which is um, 
talking to reporters and talking to members of Congress about our research and influencing it that way, influencing the process that way. But really our focus is trying to engage the public directly with information they can use to engage in the political process and figure out, you know, how to talk to their members of Congress. So we see direct democracy as a critical component of the work we're doing. Excellent. And I think this is a theme I hear over and over again. You know, first of all, that Washington has sort of lost the thread on where the American people were, yeah. as was evidenced by the election and the, the wrong analysis of many people in Washington and how that would turn out. But also, you know, I guess I want to open this up to the rest of the panelists if they have anything more to say about Evo's idea that there's this world beyond the Beltway. So Tell us about this could world. I, could I just say one oh, quick sure. thing in response? You know, we use uh, social media as a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. So we put information out and then we see what people are saying about it. We see in Twitter responses or Facebook feeds. And I think that's a really, I mean, I use that myself with my own Twitter feed, which is I think it's really critical, the, the two-way street. We understand what activists and progressives are interested in because we can see the difference between one legislative fight and how people are using our information and another legislative fight. So I think this feedback loop of social media is incredibly helpful to us to learn from people every day. Would, would any of the other panelists like to talk about how their organizations are connecting to the world outside the Beltway, Sarah? So, so um, we're, we're not in the same privy with relationship with the activist community, but the goal of being able to reach people with the nugget, the insight from work that may have been you know, months and months and, and very complex and technical is a huge challenge. And uh, we've had a couple of things that we've been thinking about a lot that have been very effective. First is data visualization. People see a picture. It is so much more powerful. Twitter has evolved, so it's very easy to have the picture be tweeted. And that picture then can, uh, people can engage with it and see um, layers. And that's the second thing we do is we think a lot about the credibility. Because in a world where you can tweet whatever you like, if you aren't able to then uh, be able to dig down through layers. So we often think about a pyramid of products. And um, you build in some ways from the bottom, where you not only have in uh, some cases your research, but your methodology and even perhaps the data so that somebody can else can, can look and validate. Now, only a small part of our audience is probably going to ever do that. But the fact is, especially for reporters and others, that kind of transparency that involves from the access to the underlying uh, analytic frame. Now then you maybe have an issue brief or something that's shorter and more accessible. And then you may have something, a blog post or something that someone might write. And then you have the kind of the picture or the uh, quick, uh, now it's 280 characters you could tell about it. That story um, is part of the way that that short insight has credibility in the larger community. And so thinking about layers of products and your audience for the short may be the widest and your audience for the may be the longest, but that audience at the base is part of how you establish people's confidence so that you can get traffic for the short. Interesting. It's something I, we hear a lot about in the news business, taking the same work, reprogramming it, repackaging it for different audiences based on how people like to absorb information and so you can reach more people. I'm going to go to Eric and then Evo and then Kay. Um, <clears throat> I was just going to say real quickly, in the project I'm working on, Defending Digital Democracy, we're going out to lots of states. I've had research teams go to 28 different states. And what's really interesting to me is these are for state election officials and secretaries of state, all parties, some nonpartisan. They're, they're actually most interested in learning and in getting training and things that they can use. And I think that reflects more broadly in the United States right now. There's a thirst for knowledge, not just facts or trying to figure out what real <laughs> facts are. People want to learn. It's a function of the information age and the information environment. And so that's where I think a lot of different organizations, not just the Kennedy School, are well positioned to help people learn, grow, do practical things to make themselves, their organizations better. Excellent. Eva? Just on, on Sarah's point of the pyramid, that's one th way to think about it is, is how do you communicate uh, <coughs> the same set of data in very different ways to, to reach uh, a different audience. The other what you're trying to do is actually reach different audiences with that same piece of data. And to think about it very directly, I mean, when I started off in this business writing a book and being able to do a panel at Brookings was the highlight of, uh, uh, of what one did. And then you went back into your office and wrote another book. Uh, and you know, so every two years you'd come outside 
uh, for, for a day to do, to do a book launch. And, and if you got lucky, you might get on in a Diane Rehm show. And then you were done. Um, and, and, and the reality is that the hunger that, that Neera talked about for fact, for data, for understanding, the mobilization of our population uh, writ large means that they are going to look for stuff. And you need to be able to provide it in the way that they want to consume it. So you're going to get to a 70-year-old uh, a, a, a in a different way than you would to a, a millennial. And the, it's not that the information you're providing is different. It's how you provide it and how you package it. And some will like video, and other will want to have an in, a, a, a roundtable discussion for an hour that they can watch uh, uh, online or read in a podcast. And it's thinking, so bringing the communication piece and the audience piece into the work of the think tank is in some ways now more important uh, than it has ever been. Uh, the challenge is it's more difficult to fund. So there is a, you need to figure out a way to, to, to get that part of the, of the institution uh, funded. But if I look at you know, our, our uh, place, uh, the communication team is just boomed because you have to be able to communicate to those different audiences in the different ways uh, that matter to them. And, and we don't make that up. We can't say, just read the book because they won't, uh, and though, but you also need a book because some people do still want to read books, so you need to do all of it. Thanks, Lynn. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say that the, um, t to piggyback on what you were saying, the, 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 the digital platform is a very complex platform, and I actually heard a briefing, which I'm sure all of us have had at some point, that talks about who uses which platform. So if you want to go to males between the age of so-and-so, that's Twitter. If you want to go to a younger demographic, that's Instagram. If you want to go to another demographic, that's through podcasts. So it is very complex and is very much a science. You've probably done a lot of research and work in that area. But I think in the think tank community, as we are looking at our ideas and trying to figure out how to engage a public and inform a public, not just our public, you know, our folks here in Washington, but across America, um, it becomes a very complex science at how you do that and actually use the digital platform to make that happen. Excellent. Uh, I want to move slightly to a, a related topic. Um, and I want to start with Eric for this one because it strikes me that what you're doing, Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> helping states protect against foreign attacks from adversary state and non-state actors. Yeah. You know, in a normal environment, that would seem to be an inherently governmental function. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a reality in this room that everybody knows all too well, which is that uh, civic society around the world, especially uh, institutions that promote you know, what we quaintly call the liberal world order, human rights, democracy, are under assault. Attack. All right, it's, it's, it's every, by every measure, it seems clear. And we have uh, an administration, let's say, that's been, in my view, inconsistent in its messaging and uh, action in responding to that reality. And what we see in your project, frankly, is, a, a, in my view, a reaction to that. And I'm wondering if you can talk about how you see your role as a think tank that's doing something that's protecting a, our nation from a foreign adversary in this crazy environment where even the basic terms of that debate are highly in dispute. Yeah. Um, so I'd say to me this started as a very personal thing, right? I was chief staff in the Pentagon watching everything that was happening in 2016. And so it's not just the Trump administration. It was us, the Obama administration too, did not respond forcefully enough. So it's a bipartisan thing. When I got out and I talked to these guys, Robbie Mook is uh, on the project. He was Hillary Clinton's campaign manager. Matt Rhodes was Mitt Romney's campaign manager. Both of those campaigns were hacked. The Romney campaign by the Chinese for intel purposes, you know, all about uh, Secretary Clinton's problems. We just decided we wanted to do something about it. And the environment is ripe for that, which I think for all of us means you can do more because there was a distrust in government, whether it was the Trump administration or the Obama administration, and it was something practical that we could do so we're put putting together these playbooks where you help a campaign or a state improve their cybersecurity game so that they're able to respond, that their defenses are better, they know how to react to info ops, 
in a way that is not normal for what a state election person is thinking about when they're thinking about their campaign. We put them through tabletop exercises, just like I did in the Department of Defense, where they exercise to failure, and they're so scared by that that they don't want it to happen, and it motivates them a little bit more, too. So I think the most important thing is that, um, you know, we can do some, but this is an inherently governmental function, right? I was at the Department of Defense. It is not up to the state of West Virginia to be deterring the Russian intelligence services um, from attacking the United States. You can do a little bit of deterrence by deterrence through denial, which is having better defenses, resilience that you bounce back. But there's still something there, which is why you still need think tanks to advance policy-relevant ideas and strategy at that higher level, I think, too. Those two things combined, there's some magic recipe there, I think. Are you getting cooperation from this administration in this effort? We are, actually, yeah. It's, uh, I think there was someone who mentioned there, there are pockets of the administration where people are super willing to help. They're good Americans. They're in public service just like they always have been, and they want to do something. So we're working pretty closely with DHS, some good people there, the Election Assistance Commission. It's not at all that you know, there's resistance. Now, I think I need to tell you all the politics of this are super complicated, right? You know, Not only that, but the, we have the tech sector on board with Google and Facebook, and that has made it even more complicated but more important because they're part of the issue. We need them to help. We need them to, to address things within their organizations that I think are a weakness, too. So putting all those things together isn't easy, but it, you know, if you can do it and keep it together, you can make a little bit of a difference. Are there any other panels that would like to talk about uh, the think tank community's responsibility in sort of defending the liberal democratic world order as we know it. I, I, I'm happy to just say a word. We actually have a project with uh, AEI on uh, essentially this topic, which is um, really focused on U.S. Uh, the U.S. Europe uh, European alliance and how the institutions between the United States and Europe have been the pillars of the liberal democratic order and how we are, uh, those are under assault from Russian forces. Obviously, I could go on for seven hours about our election, but won't in terms of what happened with WikiLeaks and everything, but uh, looking at Russian interference and support for white nationalist extremist policies in uh, Britain, France, uh, Poland, Hungary, uh, AFD in Germany. And you know, I, I'm actually really pleased that the American Enterprise Institute and the Center for American Progress have both come together to analyze why these trends are happening and actually what supporters of the liberal democratic order, uh, which you know has tended to be bipartisan in the past, can do to strengthen our institutions in the face of this assault. And it's you know, they've been a fantastic partner on this work, and they have interesting partnerships in Europe uh, that are, uh, as do we, that are facing very similar uh, similar assaults and uh, has been a fascinating conversation. Excellent. And uh, just a couple more questions, we'll go, and then we'll, we'll go to the audience. Um, I was intrigued, Sarah, by what you were saying about the need to increase relationships with Silicon Valley. This seems to be the holy grail of this whole uh, community because we know it's obvious that we have to do this. We have to figure out how to talk to each other, how to work with each other, and how to solve problems together. Yet it still doesn't seem to really work. There's projects, there's lots of money, there's lots of you know committees and task forces. What are we all missing? I mean, I think there's fault on both sides, frankly. And what would you say to each side in order so that we can sort of get on the same page and and actually make up the ground that we've lost by being separated for so long? So I think, first of all, we should think of Silicon Valley is a word that is actually represents a pretty diverse set of institutions, so we should be careful. There is uh, the uh, philanthropic arms of a lot of new money that has been formed from the tech sector, not only in Silicon Valley across the country, but a lot of it is certainly there. There's sort of the whole fintech sector, which is, uh, you know, technology is a part of almost every other one of our industries. So when we think about partnering with technology, it's not just the information companies, it's the technology parts of, you know, everything from banks and other institutions. Um, so there's people's personal wealth and philanthropic wealth. There's the companies in their business sense, and increasingly the companies in their philanthropic slash policy arm, too. So there's, there's a lot of diversity there. Um, and it's, I think that's relevant in part because particularly the parts of the companies that are in the policy business 
are a little more, uh, they tend to hire out of uh, former government, and so they, they, they have one foot in both worlds, and I think that's an interesting bridge that we can try to build. Uh, to my own institution, I, I literally had the tough love conversation the other day where I kind of def deflated some folks, where I was telling them, let me tell you how, how you seem sometimes to some of the folks that I'm out on the hustings engaging with, and Bridget's smiling, because it wasn't a fun day. Um, but it was, you know, there, there's a musty dustiness to some of us, uh, how we're perceived. You're all about trying to fix government so that you can make a particular program 5% more effective. We want 5x or 10x by completely reinventing the model and all you're doing is sort of moving the existing levers where we're gonna invent something new that can replace those levers. And uh, when I'm uh, uh, engaging often with uh, people who come from the social entrepreneurship world or the tech sector, they're often saying uh, that, look, What's happening on Capitol Hill is just emblematic of the sclerosis of the public policy process. So we're going to ignore it. We're going to work on something else. And if you guys are all organized around the public policy process, why should we bother? Now, I think, the, to my point earlier, that they increasingly understand they have social responsibilities. And I actually think we have a, a moment of, generally, of corporate um, change in their attitude about their role and responsibility towards um, solving society's problems, maybe partly because they too are frustrated with government. And um, as they try to think about how they play a constructive role, it's kind of hard not to just decide I'm going to put a white piece of paper on the board and solve a problem without any knowledge. And so what I say to them is you could actually be helpful to ground some of that effort in some history, in some data, in some knowledge of uh, the, uh, the folks uh, that you are trying to solve problems for. Just a perfect example is um, I spend time all the time people talking about how we can solve some problem because we have access to the big data from the private sector. And um, I'll say, but you know, understand that the private sector only collects information about part of society, right? Mm -hmm. Some people aren't engaging in those commercial enterprises at the low end. So, you should, we should be talking about what are the, how do you uh, compensate for some of those data anomalies. So anyway, I think there's a lot of real insight. Um, I, I, I sort of tell my guys, we gotta bathe in this stuff a little bit more, guys, and it's gotta rub off on us, but I hope that there's some openness to having us rub off on them too. Fascinating, thank you. So right before I go to questions, I just, one more question for me. This is sort of my journalistic interest about think tanks at this moment. I'm gonna put on my reporter hat. A lot of uh, writing now about think tank funding, especially from foreign entities, foreign governments, adversary governments, foreign entities connected very loosely to adversary governments. It's something that we have to think about, that we have to, in, I'm opining here, I'm an opinion columnist, it's something that we have to talk about, be more transparent about, set some standards and practices so that we know what we're doing, we know where the lines are. Um, I'd just like to ask each of you to, before we go to questions, you know, whether it's the Chinese Communist Party or the government of Norway, right? The are they an adversary government? Oh, I'm, I'm saying one or the other, right? <laughs> oh, God. They are different. It depends who you talk to. Um, <laughs> what is your, your view and your organization's view on where the line should be? And, uh, you know, that's it. You so we draw the line at uh, transparency and uh, accountability. Uh, we decided very early on that actually saying no to certain fun funding streams didn't help us. Um, but that didn't mean you necessarily would say yes to every funding stream that comes down, uh, down the door. Uh, and transparency is number one. So we actually publish literally every single gift and indicate where that money goes. Uh, and it's available on our website um, and we do it annually as one form. And secondly, we do have certain accountability standards, uh, particularly when it comes to government funding, U.S. and non-U.S. Uh, there's, uh, there in certain circles, U.S. government funding may be equally seen as suspect as Norwegian government funding or what have you, particularly if it comes from, say, the intelligence community. Um, uh, and as a result, uh, we have a standard where a committee in the board actually needs to approve before we move forward. 
but it's all about accountability and transparency rather than saying um, we, you know, we, will, we will only take from foundations. Because the day will come, the story is yet to be written, it's probably in the works, about how certain think tanks are unbelievably taking money from this foundation, which is uh, money that was actually gotten from a, uh, an industry that is suspect for some reason or other. Uh, or this individual, which we have already had. A number of stories by an individual who has a different agenda that is now giving money to a think tank. So as a result, the only way it seems to me you deal with it is, is through transparency uh, and accountability. And let me uh, a plug for this group and for Jim. Because when this issue started to come forward three, four years ago, it was this network that allowed all of us to share data. In fact, Jim did a report uh, uh, on, uh, on how accountability and, and independence and transparency uh, measures on, on uh, think tank funding. And we just learned from each other. And we, we adopted each other's best practices. Um, uh, and that's what a network like this is really useful for. We can all make our own decisions how we want to implement those best practices, but having a network to be able to do that was extremely helpful. Thank you. Josh, I don't know the, the total answer to that question, 30 days on the job, but I promise you I will ask. Uh, having said that, I can tell you this, um, that I know that we operate in an atmosphere of transparency. Um, I know that we partner with people who are fighting for freedom and democracy and liberty around the world, um, and that we have uh, opportunities to partner in many foreign countries. Uh, but I don't know the exact answer to that. Uh, I, I, I will tell you this, that I do know that I have seen articles that have been written about uh, relationships with corporations, with individuals. Uh, so whether it's a country, a person, or an individual, I think that we in the think tank community are always suspect about where our resources come from. Thank you. Um, this is a good question. This is something that I think is maybe even more challenging at Harvard because a lot of people try to give you money for the halo effect, either individuals or countries or foundations, and so we pay a lot of attention to it. I think, and I hope I'm not wrong, in the case of the Belfer Center, every time we've taken a major donation, unless there's some clause from a private individual, which sometimes happens but still would be legit, we just put out a press release so that people would see what we're doing, what the project is for. Um, there have been cases already since the time I've been here in the last six months when we have sent back money because of something else we found out. And that's pretty hard. Usually the money's already committed, sometimes spent. That means you're taking it out of the bank, which is not where a uh, center or president, yeah, but, but we've done that. We turn down money all the time from people who are sketchy and trying to buy some fellowship or program. So I'm sure we're not perfect, but you know, your reputation is the one thing you have that's really worth something in life. So. Mm -hmm. You know, we, I think, take that very seriously. So we have a broad rule that the financial interests of any donor cannot dictate the work uh, that we do. In terms of, uh, so we also, uh, we also put, it, put online all of our donors. We have in the last year some donors who are more interested in anonymity in the Trump era, but, you know, like 90% of our donors are online. Um, and where it's anonymous, it's listed. Uh, in terms of foreign donations, uh, we have definitely rejected foreign donations that seem focused on uh, any adversarial interest of the U.S. I think it's a broad question we all have to think through about that line. Uh, but uh, we have had interests, or not even, not even countries, but thank you, um, organizations that are connected to countries and their governments uh, that seem interested in funding us to influence U.S. national policy, and we've rejected that, uh, rejected those lines of funding because of our concern um, about essentially perceptions of what, uh, what that would mean. In addition to agreeing with everything said here, we have a, a funding set of funding principles that are online. Uh, they include that not only do we list annually, but each product that has a directed source of funds is listed on the product. Um, we do, I think we're probably unique here, we're uh, a 
some, some years more than 50% funded by federal government contracts and grants for research from all kinds of different federal agencies. Um, uh, and so we don't always get to dictate the contract terms, but we actually have uh, preferred language to, uh, that protects our independence, and if we're going to vary from it, certain approval processes that have to be met are all dictated now in advance. Um, and when we take uh, corporate money uh, that is uh, not just general support, um, we have a process in which a committee of scholars in which I'm not allowed to sit. Uh, so they get to look at, is it consistent with our funding principles, and uh, does this work serve our mission, and what kind of rules are in place to demonstrate and prove independence. And I get a written report of that before we accept any grant. So there's sort of built-in processes. So e someone may still challenge our decision to do that, but our reasoning was uh, prior to the grant documented in advance, so we feel like people will understand uh, they can disagree with the reasoning, but uh, we can uh, defend it not after the fact. Yeah, we also have uh, built-in processes. I mean, I think the first one is simply the stink test. Somebody approaches you to do something, yeah. and you just sort of think, this just doesn't sound right, and, and, and it'll oftentimes be a, a lobbyist or it'll be someone with a particular interest, but our, our board has set very strict rules in this. We only take, from, with regard to foreign governments, we take no money from governments that are non-democratic, not allied with the United States. Uh, that's very clear. That cost us millions of dollars in the last few years. There are all sorts of places in Central Asia, the Middle East, Asia as well, you could raise a lot of money from, but we feel it is very important for the independence of our work and for the fact that we believe in U.S. international leadership, we believe in human rights, that, this, that we not accept money from, the, from, from these sources. We take money from uh, the U.S. government, from the Office of Net Assessment for policy work, and actually our policy the amount of money we got last year actually dropped significantly in the first year of the Trump administration from the Obama administration, which you wouldn't have expected, but these are competitively bid uh, projects that we, we bid on. Uh, and we take money from uh, governments overseas, from the Japanese, the Taiwanese, uh, years past the Canadians, the Danes, and, and others uh, for our work. But we make sure that we're doing policy work, we're not doing outreach, <laughs> we're certainly not doing lobbying, and uh, we publish all of our donors in our annual report and have them uh, on, the, on the web. Excellent. I've got you all on the record now. Uh, let's uh, go to questions. Uh, can I ask you to um, give your name and affiliation and put your comment in the form of a question? I'll start randomly with uh, Congresswoman Harper. <laughs> so, Josh, we're all expecting you to write a new column which will reconsider your views and, de and describe how fabulous we all are and give some mention to Jim. Just, just do it. Um, so... <laughs> At the Wilson Center, by the way, we uh, have total transparency with uh, contributions. We don't accept anonymous contributions, and our presidentially uh, appointed board uh, has to approve every foreign government uh, uh, contribution. My question is about the role of think tanks as teaching organizations. I was listening to Eric, and I'm really jealous that he gets to teach really smart kids, uh, even if they go to Planet Harvard, which I confess I, had, I attended in another century. Uh, but but what about the rest of us? Uh, at the Wilson Center, we have a foreign policy school on Fridays, and we teach 50 Hill staff, bipartisan, bicameral, uh, in a batch. We, we're in our 10th semester, and we try to teach foreign policy subjects relevant to the Hill, free from spin. We also have a cyber boot camp, and we're into about the fourth group of that. So now we have this army of five or 600 staffers who didn't know each other before they got here, even if they're in the same party on the same floor, and actually talk to each other and have thought about policy subjects. Now, I just, you don't have to be us, but hey, I just wonder what you all think about your obligation to teach as well as to write brilliant, or think brilliant thoughts and put them out on these a variety of social media platforms. Who wants to jump on that? We'll start with uh, Ken. Sure, yeah, look, for Hudson, we have a, f a few hundred interns each year. We work closely to mentor them. We have seminars each week with feature our scholars interacting and having discussions. We also have a political studies program, which is an intensive six-week program over the summer. It's highly selective. Last year, we admitted 18 undergraduates from over 600 applicants that study both uh, political philosophy, politics, and uh, policy, and we have everyone from uh, Justice Breyer uh, to Leon Cass and somewhere uh, in between uh, uh, meeting, discussing with them, and the students find it is the most intensive uh, education experience of their lives. Uh, we 
This year we're going to be able to double it to 36 students. It is very costly. There are seminars, there's travel, there's lodging, but it is a, a really unique thing that we do and we're very proud of. Um, I'm jealous a little bit. Um, uh, one of the things that we've recently done, it's a slightly different version of this education model, um, is uh, created something we call the Lab at Urban, which is essentially an advisory practice group. Um, because we find that often there are insights out of research that philanthropy, that the pr business sector, uh, that other actors, uh, community foundations or even local business groups would like, but they can't mine and pull out the relevant insight from literature from us or others and make sure what, figure out what's credible and how to sift through it. And they may want to create a project that is very much informed by evidence, but the translation between scholars and some of the practical decision makers is such that um, they don't always find the information is actionable. And so for us, the lab is a way in which we can design projects with uh, end users that they have to come in and say, we're interested in being evidence informed. We want to ground our next uh, body of philanthropy. We want to ground our community-based strategy for um, the city of Atlanta, or whatever it is, in evidence. Um, help us do that. And that's been a way in which we can uh, teach and, and sometimes learn together uh, that it makes the information more practical. Uh, I'd say we have an internship project. Uh, we also, so uh, we have a wide range of interns. One thing that we did, and, and Sarah helped start, is something called the Leadership Institute, which is, uh, which has changed a little bit, but the Leadership Institute is a way for uh, particularly uh, pro policy professionals of color to get more training in policy work. Um, we see a big dearth of uh, people of color in the policy field on the Hill and the administration, whether it's the Trump administration or the Obama administration. So one of the one of the goals that we've developed is to create more of a pool of folks who uh, they spend time with our policy teams, they learn more in depth about policy issues. Uh, there's a weekly seminar, um, and then you know we have a pretty good track record of that being a great pool of people for kind of higher level jobs on the Hill and in the administration, or at least in the previous administration. That's a very large part of what we do at the Heritage Foundation. One story you'll find it interesting is we speaking to a recent group of uh, some of the best and brightest young conservative minds who came to the Heritage Foundation to equip themselves to go out. And I started out with them by saying, how many of you are here to uh, get the knowledge, the skills, and the ability to go out and annihilate the opposition? And a few of them said, yeah. That's what I want to do. I said, I am so sorry. You're in the wrong internship <laughs> program. That's not why you're here. You're here to, to learn and get the knowledge, skills, and ability to go out and win the argument. Uh, the name of the game is multiplication and addition. It's not subtraction and uh, division. So as a result of that, uh, we, uh, we want to teach them how to think through and to be able to carry the day with a conversation it, through civil discourse, not go out and annihilate the opposition. Uh, so we have a huge internship program. We have a resource bank where we work with community leaders from all over the country to train them. Uh, we also work with Capitol Hill staffers uh, with uh, training uh, and learning opportunities. So uh, we have quite a few and we see that as a part of our responsibility. Uh, but to train them how to go out and uh, to engage in civil discourse and win the day with discussion. Great idea. Okay, let's keep it moving. In the back, in the very back. Sir. Hi, my name is Kolela. I'm from South Africa. And I'm a scholar here at the Wilson Center. Um, I wonder if uh, any one of you can talk about think tanks that are not necessarily uh, about policy and engaging the political process. But think tanks that exist to generate basic ideas, to do history. I'm a biographer, I'm doing a biography of Nelson Mandela. And one of the things that I have learned over the past 20 years in South Africa is that it's very hard to get money 
for think tanks that engage in ideas for their sake, if you like, for intrinsic importance of ideas. And this has caught up with us in South Africa. Now Nelson Mandela is called a sellout by young people. And the reason they call him a sellout is a lot to do with the fact that there is no basic research about the history of the country. Mm. And so it seems to me that in this era of fake news in particular, it's very important to also have think tanks that just do basic historical research. And I wonder if um, any one of you can talk to that. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll just say a word. I, uh, one thing I think about the differentiation, uh, we get, I get this question on the other end, which is the differentiation in the US uh, between think tanks and universities. And I'd say in the United States, we have uh, something called a progressive studies program, which actually uh, does analysis, does research and analysis on trends and, and, and opinion, but also does a lot of work on history. Um, and we've in the past tried to organize historians uh, because we recognize the importance of understanding history to today's events. That work is in the US mostly funded by universities who have a different funding mechanism than, than we do. Um, so I think that makes it a little bit different, but I would say I've, we've always found it difficult to raise money or funding in the US for historical analysis and historical research because, um, because funders are much more interested in, you know, in policy, when we say policy impact, uh, affecting people's lives today. <clears throat> Excellent. Oh, did you want to say something? Yeah, I would just say that that is an important part of the work that we do do at the Heritage Foundation, and we have those institutes within the larger organization. Uh, as an example, we have um, an institute within the Heritage Foundation that studies first principles uh, and uh, produces research and data and analysis uh, and looks at it from a historic perspective. So sometimes you can find those individuals and those donors out there who are willing to fund that kind of research. And our scholars are very appreciative of it. Excellent. We are out of time. I want to thank our panelists. Invite Atlantic Council President Fred Kemp up for some closing remarks. Uh, first of all, applause for just a really rich conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, just a couple of comments before I uh, thank the panelists by name and also my co-hosts. Uh, first of all, I think one of the things you have to say listening to the panelists up here is it is true that Donald Trump is good for the American economy and employment. <laughs> uh, I mean, on the right-hand side, you're growing. On the left-hand side, you're growing. In the middle, we've done just fine, even though I think it is easier to get funding on the left and right. I think people uh, <laughs> abroad are, are drawn uh, to organizations that can represent the America that they, uh, that they wish existed. Um, the, um, the other thing, Jim, is I think... Uh, if you listen to everyone on this panel, uh, think tanks is kind of a misnomer uh, because you all do so much more than that and you're going to have to do more than that still in the future as do we. Um, uh, we also see, and I think the one thing that you felt in this conversation is this uh, notion of historic moment. They all said it in different ways. At the Atlantic Council, we feel uh, the historic moment's as important as 1945, as important as 1919. And you see four trends that you wouldn't have thought were on the radar screen four or five years ago. One of them is the uh, possibility, if not uh, threat, of major power conflict. Uh, the real questions over the future of democracies, massive questions over the future of the U.S. role in the world, large questions over the whole liberal international order that the U.S. and its allies created uh, at the end of 45. Um, this is rich terrain for us to operate in. You all have your own historic challenges to operate in. So on the one hand, these are uh, great challenges, but this is also a great moment uh, for our, our, entire, our entire industry. Underscoring this, and this is what I also heard, is that we have a truth landscape and a tech, tech landscape that are shifting under our feet and that we're dealing with both uh, simultaneously. Uh, that we're being called upon to be fact tanks and not just think tanks. We're doing that with our digital forensic research lab. We're, we've also done that in our Eurasia Center with our uh, disinformation week efforts uh, 
across the nation and then across the globe. And I've heard all, also from many of you uh, work that you're doing in this area as well. Um, in terms of the tech landscape, uh, we heard a lot about what people are doing in the tech landscape. I certainly took a lot of notes here uh, around the pyramid, around the things that CAP are doing. Uh, we all have a lot to learn in this area because we all feel a need to reach out of our expert uh, cocoons. We feel a need to reach way out of the beltway to get done what we need to get done. Uh, and, and many of us don't really have the experience or tools to do that, and we haven't done it historically over time. I shared it with a few people this morning that in the 1960s, the Atlantic Council was trying to save NATO, and we turned to Bob Hope, an entertainer, and Roger Staubach, a quarterback, as spokespeople for that era. And so we'll have to think about what the... <laughs> Uh, what the moral equivalent of that is now in, in, in our time. Yeah. Then, then, <laughs> uh, whatever it is, uh, you know, Maren Stromecki, when I first took over the Atlantic Council, said to me, I'm never going to fund a bog set. And I said, well, okay, then I won't do one. I said, but what is a bog set? It's B-O-W-G-S-A-T. Bunch of white guys sitting at a table. Uh, and, 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 and the think tank industry does, has done a lot of bunch of white guys sitting at the table over its history. Uh, I think you've seen most of that disappear. I think over time you may even see a lot of the panels disappear. But, but, I, but I think we, uh, we haven't been YouTubed. We haven't been uh, Amazon. We haven't been Ubered. Um, and let me get now to Josh, because I think you've taken a few hits today. Um, uh, you know, you may have been wrong in the first instance, but we have to be careful that you're not right over time. Yes, right. Yes. And, uh, and I think uh, the, uh, and this was where Jim McGann talked to us about how we have to think about being innovative. We have to think about, uh, uh, you know, that we're not innovative enough, we're not adapting well enough. He's absolutely right. That's what we really have to work on. Because I don't think, you know, Ford could go out of business if it doesn't handle autonomous vehicles uh, uh, the right way. The CEO of Google in Davos uh, talked about how artificial intelligence was going to be more profound than electricity or fire, which is pretty profound. <laughs> Um, uh, but I don't, I think most of us will stay alive. Most of us have the capability to do that over time. And to a certain extent, that's the weakness of our industry, because in the private sector, you go down if you're not relevant. But I think what we really have to focus on is increasing our value and increasing our relevance uh, at this in, in, in enormously historic moment. And we all agree that the challenges are historic in nature, the outcomes are uncer uncertain, and therefore our work is more important than it's ever been before. So with that, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank my co-hosts, uh, Jim McGann, everyone, uh, everything that's been said about you in terms that you've galvanized us in our community. This is one of the most interesting discussions I've heard at a really uh, uh, a crucial point for us. Uh, and, then, and then Jane Harmon, what a pleasure it is to work with you. When we talk about collaboration, uh, Jane and I sort out things, we compare notes, and I really appreciate the spirit with which we've done this, and thank you for the leadership in, in our industry um, bringing these great minds together. Uh, thanks to Evo, Kay, Eric, Nira, Sarah, and Ken, uh, and thanks especially to Josh Rogan, our moderator, who will reform his ways. Thank you very much. <laughs>